it is my pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon to share the work that I did um, with a One Health focus um, over multiple years, as Carrie said, um, in East Africa, principally in Kenya, but there was some work that was done in Uganda as well. I went to uh, work in Kenya, um, particularly to deal with smallholder pig farmers and, um, and to do what I could to prevent epilepsy due to a tapeworm called Tinea solium. Epilepsy um, was very prevalent in the communities where I was working. And unfortunately, people saw epilepsy as a curse from the devil. If a person in a family had epilepsy, they felt that Amazing. somebody that place is not in the community, um, I'm sorry, someone in the family had done something um, very bad and the person would get epilepsy and oftentimes was hidden away from the rest of the family because of that. Um, and this little fellow, Roger, was a, a, a boy with epilepsy. Luckily, his family let him go to school. Um, but unfortunately, over the time that I was working in Kenya, um, although I went to see him each time I went there, um, the last time I went, uh, he had passed. Um, so tinea solium as a cause of epilepsy. It's important to understand the life cycle of tinea solium so we can understand how we might go about preventing epilepsy. Um, a per when a person is infected with the tapeworm, um, the tapeworm lives in the small intestine of the person and every day uh, sheds eggs, about 50,000 eggs um, in their stool. If a pig has access to that stool or access to the eggs, um, they will consume the eggs and those eggs will, will, in a pig, will preferentially migrate to the muscle where they morph into a larval, the larval form of the tapeworm. And that, um, that causes the muscle of the pig, um, which is actually pork, um, to be infected. If another person consumes the larva in infected undercooked pork, the larva becomes an adult tapeworm in their intestine and the cycle continues. So the question is, is how can we prevent this disease? The World Health Organization say, says that it's likely the most preventable form of epilepsy. And sitting in, in, um, in my office in Guelph, I thought that they were probably right. All you have to do is stop uh, pigs from getting access to human stool and um, ensure that people either don't eat pork that's um, got these cysts or if they are eating um, pork that uh, they're not sure about um, to make sure that they overcook that pork. But what about the epilepsy part? Well, if a person inadvertently consumes the tapeworm egg in a person, it preferentially migrates to the brain of the person. And there it turns into these cysts, which are, um, as you can see in the bottom left corner, um, are, are um, large, uh, masses. And so we have this space occupying lesion in the brain, and that leads to epilepsy. This is the most common cause of epilepsy in um, communities where there is uh, poverty and lack of running water and lack of flush toilets, and, um, and where people are raising um, pigs. Very, very common in countries such as um, China and, and uh, elsewhere in the world where there's a lot, a lot of smallholder farmers. I was working through an organiza organization called the International Livestock Research Institute, and, um, and they do research that helps farmers step out of poverty. They particularly focus on communities where there's uh, significant poverty. And so I was working on the western edge of um, Kenya um, on the Uganda border. And the reason I was there was because it was particularly, uh, the people there were particularly poor and because they were raising pigs. These are subsistence farmers that only are able to eat uh, what they grow because they don't have money to buy food. And in 2007, the, the um, heavy rains came, they came uh, hard and they ruined the, burnt, the bean crop. And so that year, the farmers only had corn to eat. This is a very typical picture of what I saw when I went farm to farm. 
um, I would see one or a few adults and a whole slew of children. Um, typically these farms had um, eight to 14 children on them. Um, these farmers are living on less than a dollar a day. About half of the children in the communities where I was working were orphaned, mostly due to AIDS, but they could have been orphaned to other, for other reasons. And um, the orphan children weren't going to school. The families lived in mud huts that they built by hand. Uh, the women and children were responsible for bringing water from the closest well, which could be two to five kilometers away. And the family needed to gather wood in order to cook the meal. The middle generation, so the, the parents of these young children was miss, were missing. That, if you think about uh, when we had a lot of AIDS happening in Africa, it was often you know, the 20 year olds that were dying. And so this grandmother was telling me that it was very difficult for her to um, raise the food for, um, for these, all of these children. She had bad arthritis. And so um, the work was typically done by children uh, the older uh, generation or perhaps teenage mothers and fathers. Compounds were extended family units. So, so the farms that I was uh, working on were typically half an acre to two acres. Um, in this, these extended family units, you would have grandparents living there um, with their, their sons and their daughters-in-law, assuming that they were still alive. Um, most compounds only had one outhouse and the picture on the bottom right is an outhouse. So it looks like a, a small mud hut um, with often a bag or something as a door. Um, in this culture, the man couldn't use the same outhouse as the, as the daughter-in-law. And it's a patriarchal society where, where um, men are, are um, sort of taken care of first before for women. And so typically what would happen is the man would have access to the house, but the daughter-in-law wouldn't. And so often on a compound, they and the children would not use the outhouse. The first time that I traveled there um, was February of 2006. And, um, and what, I, uh, what struck me was the pigs were horribly hungry, um, very, very thin. And so too were the children. And, um, and the issue here is that pigs and people eat the same food. Their, um, our intestines uh, work the same way, our stomachs are the same. And so um, the question is, is who gets the, the food, the pigs or the children, because there's not enough to go around. In order to be prepared to do work in these communities, um, I spent six weeks in the field I um, interviewed farmers. I went to lots of farms um, with other people's research projects. Um, I interviewed um, uh, local uh, village elders and, and village chiefs. And then we did um, focus group meetings with um, farmers, with the extension officers who worked in the communities for the government and, um, and went to schools and talked to the school um, teachers and, and the principals and vice principals to understand the community. I wanted to know um, what, the, what the concerns were in the community and in particular, what the concerns of the, um, of the farmers were. So what I learned was that the pigs were typically kept by women. And because of that, um, uh, when they sold the pig, um, they would sell the pig, not by weight like we would in Canada, but they sold the pig when they had a need. And the needs might be school fees, medicines, hospital stay, they might need clothing, or between harvests, there's two harvests a year in this, uh, in this region of Kenya, um, but between harvests, they would, the family would run out of food. And so they would sell the pig in order to buy um, maize or corn in order that, would, that was their staple food. Farmers let the pigs roam um, so that the pigs could find whatever they could to eat because they couldn't afford to feed the pig. Oftentimes that caused neighborhood conflict because they might get into the neighbor's garden. Um, farmers believed they didn't get a fair price for their pig because they really didn't understand what their pig weighed when they went to sell it. They said the butchermen who, who bargained with them knew what the pig weighed, but they didn't. And so that made it very difficult to get enough money for their pig. 
And we talk to farmers and extension officers, but public health officers, and we also talk to local pharmacists and local um, public health nurses. And none of them had heard of this link between pigs and tapeworm and epilepsy. So um, the major research project that we wanted to do was to um, do our best to improve the livelihood of the smallholder pig farmers and the local butchermen uh, through education. We, we wanted to develop a way to estimate the weight of the pig so that the farmers were, um, had some agency when they were dealing with the, um, with the butchermen. We had to figure out how to feed the pig if we were going to ask the farmer to um, tie up the pig and not let the pig roam for food. And we definitely, as you can imagine, had a priority to uh, prevent tapeworm and epilepsy through what we would call the entire port value chain. And that is the person who owns the sow and boar, the, the, those that purchase piglets and raise those, um, the butchermen, and all the way to, um, to the person who, who is eating pork. And so we would call that in Canada, we'd call, we'd call that farm, farmed pork. Um, so uh, Florence Matua, um, I met when I first went to Kenya, she was doing a research project in the field and I met her in the field. Um, she is a veterinarian. She had a master's in epidemiology and um, she had an incredible way with the farmers. She was so polite and respectful and she understood how to do research. Um, as a Canadian, um, I, I I didn't know how to be with um, the farmers and how best to, to um, be polite with them. And so she was um, really my role model when it became, um, you know, with respect to cultural awareness. Florence knew how to conduct research in Kenya. She'd done it through her masters. And she also knew the importance of navigating through national, provincial and local governments. And, um, and what Florence did over the entire research uh, project, not just hers, but everybody else's as well. And with all of the summer students that we brought um, to Kenya, but she was there as our advisor and really our, uh, she was an incredible resource for person for us. I can't say enough about that. And I, and I would say that this important research that, that is this one health research uh, would never have happened without uh, Florence, but as you hear the story, you'll realize that we had to bring in many, many disciplines in order to, to address what we needed to do in this project, in these projects. So Florence's project, it was a longitudinal study. It went from 2006 to 2010. Um, we worked in a rural area called Busia on the Ugandan border and a peri-urban area called Kakamega. We did a random sample of 288 farms um, we, we had to go into each village and say who owns pigs. That was our sampling frame. We did a 70%, uh, we, we selected 70% of the um, pigs in each village. Um, we visited the farms every five months. It was interrupted in 2008. If you might remember, there was uh, political violence in uh, Kenya at the time, and so we had to postpone um, the time between two of our visits, but that was our intention, and as soon as the violence calmed down, we were able to uh, complete our last visits. Um, in 2006, after we did the far first farmer visits, we followed that by a workshop um, in, the, in the various villages, um, and then in 2008, we had analyzed our data from Busia, and we, um, we did more uh, workshops. And in 2010, we hadn't been in the Busia area for, for um, two years. We went back and we did a random sample, a completely new random sample of 50% of the farms. And we did what's called outcome mapping. And what that is, is a way to say, to figure out whether or not uh, knowledge or behaviors had changed in the long term, so over a two year time period, um, from the time we um, left the research work to when we went back to interview people and check out uh, what was happening. So how we did that, we, we selected the farm in our random, uh, well, I was really just picking a name out of a, out of a hat. Uh, we drove to where the road ended. We, um, we walked to the farm carrying our research 
uh, equipment on our backs. Um, we always brought a local official, uh, might be in the livestock official, but it might be a village elder. Um, they introduced us to the farmer and, um, the, and told them about the research. And then we began the interview and collected the pig data. If I was doing the interviewing, I would have um, an interpreter with me. So we wanted to know what the pigs weighed. Um, we would ask the farmer what they thought the pig weighed and then we would weigh their pig. If it was a large pig, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, we used a horse girth. So we strapped that under the pig's uh, belly, hung that to a spring scale that was in a pulley system in a tree. Somebody who was strong pulled on that pulley. And just as the pig got off the ground, we were able to see what the pig weighed. If it was a small pig, we just were able to put it in a little basketball net that was tied up on the bottom and we used a fish scale. On average, the farmers thought the pigs weighed 10 kilo kilograms uh, lighter than they actually did. Now this is really significant because these pigs were being sold at 30 kilograms live body weight. So if they thought the pig was only 20 kilograms, they were selling the butcher man a 20 kilogram pig in their mind, but the butcher knew that it was a 30 kilogram pig. So uh, we needed to help the farmers through that. Well, we had weight and then what we did was we measured the girth, you can see that on the bottom left and the length of the pig on the bottom right. And we took the girth measurement and the length measurement and we put that in a model, um, a mathematical model. And then we, we turned that information into this information sheet that you can see in the background. And this is how you use it. If the pig's girth is 64 centimeters, and the, and the pig's length is 70 centimeters. Then you join up those two uh, parts with those red lines. And that means that the, pigs weigh, the pig would weigh approximately 20 kilograms. Um, we, we did this analysis and then we did a random sample of a new group of pigs to see how accurate we were. And we came within 1.4 kilograms of the actual weight of the pig. So this gave the farmers a much better way to estimate the weight of the pig. Um, the only um, muscle on a live pig that you can actually look at is the tongue. And so we were looking at the tongues to determine whether or not um, the pigs in the community were carrying the tapeworm or, or could we see any evidence of, of the cyst um, on the tongue. And we were able to find uh, positive pigs on 15% of the farms. I'm not sure if I told you that most farms only had one pig. Um, some would have two and the occasional farm would have a, a, a sow and a boar and, and some piglets. Well, I wasn't able to teach people what to feed the pig because of course we use pig feed in, in on, um, commercial pig feed in Canada. So what I did was as I went farm to farm, I took pictures of what the pig people were telling me they were feeding the pigs. And then I created this chart. So um, I was able to use this pictorial chart to teach other farmers what you could feed a pig. And I knew um, from my knowledge of pigs that, that if it was food that we could eat and digest, it would be food that they, the pig could as well. Um, we noticed that the pigs were very, very uh, limited in their water access, probably because people had to carry water but the water's in the middle of this page because we wanted to talk to the farmers about the importance of water intake and growth in the pig. Uh, of course, we had to teach them about the, uh, the life cycle, which I've already shown you in a previous slide, but we also wanted to give them more information about um, the tapeworm and its link with epilepsy. When the tapeworm sheds um, their eggs, they're actually shed in a in a little packet called a proglottis. And it looks like um, a piece of rice that wiggles. And so, um, so after the person defecates, there will be this little piece of rice on their feces, on their stool. And then very quickly, the, um, the, the outside of the packet would dry out and that would disseminate all these 50,000 eggs. So we were able to say to the farmers, if, if you or anybody in your family ever sees these on their stool, you should go to the local nurse and ask for medication to be treated for this parasite. We used a training of the trainer models, Florence and I. And so what we did was we trained um, 45 government staff 
They were uh, agronomists, um, agriculture specialists, animal scientists, veterinarians, public health specialists, social workers. And sometimes we would have village chiefs or, or assistant chiefs and sometimes teachers would come to our training as well beyond these uh, government staff. And then what we did, we, we facilitated them to put workshops on in the villages. So we would find somebody's farm, uh, people would bring a chair, sit under a mango tree, and, um, and we would pay these extension officers to uh, teach the material to the farmers. The good thing about this is we're leaving information behind. So these government staff, it was their job to uh, teach the farmers long-term in the community. So if we had done it ourselves, um, we would have just taught the farmers who were there. So this is a much better model. In 2008, when we went farm to farm, we wanted to know if they, uh, the farmers had changed how they fed the pig and 58% of them had improved the pig feeding and all of them were estimating the weight of the pig before they sold it. Um, this is the same year we, entered, we began talking to butchers and asking them what they needed and how we could help them in their business and they told us that the pigs were healthier and better fed. So clearly they were seeing the benefit of us teaching farmers about feeding pigs. And, um, but they said it was harder to bargain with farmers. So it was clear that we needed to teach the butchermen also how to estimate the weight of the pig using the tape measure so that um, they would be on an even playing field when they were bargaining for the price of that pig. Um, butchers play a really important role in public health and specifically in preventing epilepsy. Um, with respect to food safety, um, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right, um, we've got a butcherman, a very successful butcherman actually, um, who has his pork out um, for display for waiting for a customer to come along and, and he would just cut some pork off what was there and sell that to the, to the customer. There's no refrigeration. And, um, and oftentimes they, the butcherman didn't get the pork inspected by a government inspector uh, for two reasons. One, it costs money to get it inspected. And second of all, it costs money to go to the slaughter slab to have the pig killed there. It's much cheaper just to take the pig out behind the shop and kill the pig and start selling. So it was important that they understand, understood about uh, epilepsy and the tapeworm and how they might prevent that. But we also were able to talk to them about um, the safety of the pig, of the pork that they had um, displayed. So we talked about um, things like uh, bacteria and we talked about um, not cutting the pork up into tiny little pieces before they sold it, those kinds of things. We asked them what their challenges were. And they said that their challenge was to find a big healthy pig. If, uh, oh, I forgot the why. Um, if, if they were desperate for a pig, they would buy a small pig, but we know from uh, the analysis that if they bought a pig that was less than um, 30 kilograms or, or maybe around 22 kilograms, they would actually lose money on that pig. Um, they said it was very difficult to maintain their business year round because they had to pay annual license fees every January, uh, public health license fees for themselves, for the people working in the shop. And then they had to pay a, a, a business fee and a fee for their way scale. And so they often didn't have that money. And so they might close down for January and February, even into March until they had collected up enough money to pay those license fees. So what we did was we gave individual um, education for each butcherman on accounting and profitability based on their own business. And then we put on group education uh, for them with respect to um, pork safety. And all of this work was done by um, another, a PhD student, Mike Levy, who had a background in economics and data management. So I'm just going to show you some of the results from Mike's work. And I've listed the costs in Canadian dollars just so um, we can all think about the same uh, value, even though, of course, it was all done in Kenyan shillings. So the purchase price of a 30 kilogram pig was $27. It would cost the farmer, I'm, I'm sorry, the butcherman, $2.90 um, to have that um, carcass inspected by the government inspector and to use the slaughter slab. And those two things go hand in hand. 
marketing costs um, all told were about uh, $9.50. The monthly expenses like rent, for example, uh, per pig was 70 cents, that's $3 a month. And the yearly license fee was about 35 um, cents. This is assuming you kill one pig per week. And uh, all told it was $18, which clearly doesn't seem like a lot to us. Um, but for them, they had very small margins. It was a lot, a lot of money and difficult for them to come up with $18. So we taught the butcher that they should probably uh, open up a bank account, uh, start putting those monthly expenses and yearly expenses um, into the bank account so that when the year ended, they would have the money available to keep their business going. Um, 2006 compared to 2010. So remember, this is the outcome um, of our study two years after we had been in the community. And we did a random sample of farms. And so some of the farmers had been part of the study and, and would have gone to workshops with us and some of them wouldn't have. So if they didn't, they would have learned either from another farmer or they would have learned from an extension officer who would have maybe um, visited their farm. So in 2006, 34% of the farmers kept the pigs confined all the time, either in a, in a barn, but more commonly tethered to a bush. Um, in 2010, it was 85%. Um, everybody was weighing their pig before they sold it. Um, the percent of pigs, uh, farms with a positive pig a dropped from 15 to 9%. So that was really positive for us. Um, almost everybody said they were cooking the, the pork longer. Uh, the butchers were, were doing that. And so too were the, um, the people on the farms. Um, uh, the farmers said they only bought inspected pork. They no longer bought pork from a pig that was killed out behind somebody's farm or behind the butcher shop. They were looking for that stamp from the government um, inspector. And um, all of the butchers said, butcher said that they were saving money for inspection. Um, because epilepsy was such a significant issue, um, people were really wanting to do whatever it was to, to prevent um, prevent the epilepsy. So that was in our favor. Um, Natalie Carter, who is joining us today, because I can see her happy face in my screen, um, was the third PhD student in this project. Natalie had a background in animal science and also in social science. Um, for her project, we had animal scientists, gender specialists, animal nutritionists, and, and um, people who uh, knew about um, uh, KTT knowledge uh, um, translation and transmission to communities. Um, so the first part of Natalie Lee's study was she looked at some of the data we had collected on the farms to find out how fast pigs were growing. And it didn't matter how old that pig was, they were growing at about 130 grams a day. They were, they were barely growing. And so the food they were eating was mostly just maintaining their current weight and just adding a little bit. Um, Natalie collected it up lots of weeds and feed, feed stops that were available on the farms. She worked with a university in Uganda to analyze that data. So we had uh, nutrient value on a dry matter basis. And then Natalie brought that information back to Canada and worked with uh, the late um, Dr. Keith DeLang, who was in um, OAC. Um, and together they developed um, complete rations for pigs based on food or feedstuffs that were available to farmers. And so oftentimes jackfruit, banana leaves, sweet potato leaves, pumpkin, avocado would all be freely available to the farmers. And, um, and Natalie actually also developed um, diets for Uganda, for Kenya and for different times of the year. The things a farmer would have to buy would be cottonseed meal, maize bran, dried fish and salt in order to make the complete ration. This is a bit of a busy slide, um, but I'll, I'll uh, step you through it. Um, so first of all, uh, I'll remind you that the, the growth rate of pigs um, in the, on the farms um, was about 130 grams a day. I've got that listed in the, in the bottom in red. Um, so what we're aiming to do is we're aiming to beat that. And, um, and what we uh, recognized on the farms was it, even 10 month old pigs were still growing at that rate. They, they, they just didn't grow. So um, Natalie was comparing commercial ration to this for what we call forage based ration or the ration that was um, being um, de developed from food that they had available. 
um, she got um, um, pigs that were all uh, local pigs in Uganda. This study happened in Uganda, um, all born within three days of one another. Um, she housed three pigs per pen in this study. And the starting weights of the pigs, they were randomly assigned to pen, um, were 7.9 um, uh, kilograms for the um, commercial ration and 8.1 for the forage. So, so those starting weights didn't differ. So if you look at the average daily gain for the eight to 18 week old pig, um, the gain um, for on commercial ration was 342, which was remarkably higher than what they could do um, on the farm and, and certainly on the forage ration, which was 100. Um, but, and if we look at the feed cost per kilogram of gain, so this is a, you know, if, if that pig gained a whole kilogram, what would it cost? Uh, for the commercial ration for those little, littler pigs or younger pigs was a, a dollar 24 um, in Canadian dollars. And in, for the forage based ration, if they could get some free, some of those foods for free, they were had avocados uh, in the trees, it cost $2.92. But if they had to buy everything, it would be six fifty eight. dollars So you can see that feed cost per gain if they were trying to feed the pig, a complete ration was much more expensive on the forage ration than it was on the commercial ration. Now let's look at the older pig. In the older pig, again, the commercial pigs grew much better. Um, but remember, uh, at the beginning of this, of this uh, presentation, I told you that the farmers couldn't afford to buy commercial ration. So even though they would grow much faster, um, that feed cost per kilogram gain was $2.98. Compare that to what would happen if you fed these older pigs um, the forage-based ration. So they could grow at 310 um, grams a day, much better than the 130 um, on um, when the pigs just are foraging and finding their own food. Um, and the feed cost per gain, if the farmer had some of those freely available feeds, was only 70 cents per kilogram gain. And if they had to buy some, was still only $1.63. So in conclusion, from this huge project that, that Natalie ran, um, we concluded that, that if possible, the farmers should feed the pig commercial ration until they hit 12 kilograms body weight. That would cost them about $5. And then after that, they should switch to the forage based ration, which was much cheaper and the pigs grew quite nicely on that food. Um, Next, Natalie put on workshops to teach the farmers how to make these feeds. So she had, um, as you can see, um, the foods laid out, the farmers were chopping and mixing and grinding and making the feeds. And we recognized that, um, that the farmers would have to put in a significant amount of time in order to make the food for these um, pigs. And that would fall on the women. And the question is, is, was it worthwhile to the women to gather up these foods, um, make the mix, mix up the ration for the pigs um, for the amount of gain um, that those pigs would get. They'd be healthier and gain better, but it was it worthwhile for the farmer. Um, what we know in Ken from our work in Kenya is that women kept most or sometimes all of the money from the pig sale. It was their responsibility to look after the pig they um, sold, uh, they, they bargained with the butcher about 70% of the time and they kept most of the, the money and the money went to support the family. Um, what Natalie found in her work, so she did um, focus groups with women and focus groups with men separately. And, um, and the women in women headed households said, absolutely, they would like to do this. Um, it would be worth it to them because the pig would be more valuable to them and they would be able to keep the money. In um, the male headed households, the women said, well, sometimes we, uh, we do sell the pig and we try to keep the money. But when our husband finds out that we keep the money, it leads to violence. And so they were less likely, they were le much less inclined to put the effort into doing this for the pig when they knew that they weren't going to benefit like the women did in the women headed households. So for me, uh, that, uh, that, that study and that analysis um, that Natalie did um, showed that even when we find something that seems to be positive from a researcher point of view, 
um, it may have uh, cultural ramifications that we don't know, especially when we don't belong in that culture. So that was the, the, the pig research that we did, pig farmer and butcherman research that we did. And then I'll just uh, spend a few minutes talking to you about the project that we did um, to help educate the AIDS orphans. We went into the communities uh, where I was first working with Florence and met with uh, the community members and the home and school committee and said, you know, we recognize that the AIDS orphans and the destitute children aren't going to school. And uh, what could we do in order to encourage them to go to school? And, um, and they said, well, why don't you go away for a couple of weeks and we're gonna hold some community meetings and we would like to write a proposal to give to you um, to tell you how we, what we would like you to do. And so they wrote a proposal uh, um, that said that they would like a lunch program at the primary school to encourage AIDS orphans to come. They said that these children weren't eating, eating enough. If they came to school in the morning and they went home, there was nothing to eat at lunch. And so they would stay away. And, um, and if we had a lunch program, the children would be able to learn because they'd eat and that they would probably come because there'd be food there. Um, we talked about the fact that we wanted this to be a six year project. So um, the community came up with multiple projects that they wanted us to establish at the school so that um, after a six year time period, the community could take responsibility for the lunch program and educating the orphaned children. So we started this uh, project called Children Bukati. Bukati was the name of the first school we started this at. And um, there, was, uh, a, there were a lot of volunteers in Kenya, but principally the, the principal of the school was, um, was very, very important to make sure that the project run there, ran there. And here in Canada, we had many, many volunteers and we raised money uh, just by word of mouth and individual people uh, donating money to the project. So this is what we saw in July of 2006 when we went to the school. Um, there was an air of uh, an, an attitude of hopelessness in the communities and we went farm to farm, but indeed there was too at the school, not just in the children, their faces and their attitude and what they wore, but when you look at um, the picture on the right, those are the classrooms. And so the children um, in recess time or if they stayed at school over lunch because there was no food at home, so they just hung out, um, they were responsible for making bricks. So they were making bricks and they were also building desks and, um, and the building on the right hand side of the picture and, and, and the one behind but you can't see it very well um, are classrooms that are falling apart. And so they, the children were responsible for making bricks and then they were using those to rebuild the classrooms. There were um, many, already many AIDS orphans at the school and the principal and vice principal showed us the list. And it looked like this. So there was a, a Kevin who was 12 years old. His parents had died in 1997. He was being raised by a grandmother who was 79, who was looking after nine children. And Evans, 12, parents died in 2000, was being raised by an uncle who was 69, looking after 14 children. And this list just went on and on. And, um, and to get on this list, the children brought their parents' death certificate to school. So from a Canadian perspective, it was, um, it was quite emotionally overwhelming. So we started a project in 2006. Um, by 2007, we had raised enough money from Canadians to have a lunch program for all kindergarten children five days a week and everybody else just one day a week. Uh, we started building projects. We had um, hens and we were selling eggs. We had broiler chickens. We had sheep. We were selling lambs. We had um, gardens. Um, on the farm, uh, on the school property. And by 2008, we were feeding the orphan children and destitute children three days a week in all kindergarten grade one, two, and three, five days a week. Um, and what was great is the children had the opportunity to work on these projects and, and learn from them. Uh, but it was obvious we weren't going to ever reach sustainability. So in 2009, um, we raised a significant amount of money and bought 11 acres of land that was right next to the school property. Uh, we brought in an expert in permaculture and we established agriculture and forestry projects on the land. Uh, we improved the soil using swales. Those are the, these trenches that gathered water during the heavy rain, composting, manure, 
and intercrop planting. Uh, we had fish ponds, greenhouses, tree nurseries, and um, we introduced uh, dryland rice that hadn't been in the community before, and also um, uh, termite resistant bananas. Within 11 months of um, starting the project, all 1,200 children at the school were being fed five days a week. So we, we had to reach sustainability. As you can see from the chart, I hope you can see from the chart, that from 2006 to 2010, uh, the number of AIDS orphans and destitute children coming to the school went from 150 to 800. This community no longer kept kids at, at home um, if they were school age from, from nursery school to, um, uh, to grade eight, they came to school. Um, the project in 2010 then moved to two um, other schools. We did projects at two other schools um, ending in 2018 and over time fed and educated more than 1800 children. So some University of Guelph International Development students um, went into the communities and uh, after the project, and uh, I guess for one during one of the project, one of the school projects, and they did, they gathered community feedback. Um, what they recognized was there was higher academic performance at all three schools and more girls were finishing school. Um, at one point we had a master's student um, in nutrition who went to the school um, and did schools and did some studies and uh, recognized that the children's needs were being met on days that they were being fed at school. Um, the community nurse said there was less sickness. Instead of 10 children coming every day to the um, clinic, she had more like four to eight coming a week and the children had more energy. Um, the community talked about increased feed sec food security. So it wasn't just because the children were eating at school, but the improved farming techniques that we were doing on the school projects were being taught to the, to the locals. So a couple of times a year, the local farmers um, could come to the school, the grade eights and grade seven students and the teachers taught uh, local farmers how to use these improved farming techniques. They took them back to their farm and they developed greenhouses and they started growing trees from seed and reforested the community and, um, and you know, used dry, dry land rice and inter, uh, crop planting. So they just grew more and better food. They said there was less community conflict because um, there were better relationships within families because it was more food between neighbors because the children were actually at school and not running the streets and between the school and families because now the, the families were being invited onto the school property. Well, this uh, project uh, um, over the years took so very many people, I'm gonna get emotional here. Um, um, Florence and Mike and Natalie were, were the main players. Obviously they were my PhD students. Um, we had co-investigators from the University of Guelph and universities in Uganda and in Kenya from uh, Switzerland and from the International Livestock Research Center. Uh, of course, we have to thank the smallholder farmers, butchers, and extension officers, and the principals at the school and teachers at the schools who, who just did so much work. Um, we had many, we had 101 undergrads who came and worked on the projects over time. I've listed those that actually uh, did research and published their research papers. And we had funding support from multiple sources. Um, not all are listed here, but the International Livestock Research Institute Canadian Food Inspection Agency, Veterinarians Without Borders, and OVC scholarships and bull tra travel funds and, and, and others. So, so lots and lots of people, lots and lots of, um, of disciplines that participated in this work. And, um, and so I think it truly was a One Health project that, um, that had social, as social health aspects, um, human health aspects, animal health aspects, and, and, um, and it really took this huge team to be able to um, come up with some solutions. Um, and I think it, you know, for me, it taught us that we could empower people through education. So thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't go too long and I'd be happy to take questions if there are some. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Dewey. We can certainly uh, see your passion coming through when you talk about it and it's fascinating work. But we have some questions in the chat from Michael. So he says, 
given that the production objectives are not clearly defined, how can the farmers budget for what they can or may not measure? Is tethering or confinement sustainable for them given their erratic crop seasons? Great questions, Michael. Um, so, so they actually know what they pay for the piglet. Um, and they didn't know how much the pig was growing, uh, but we actually gave them a little bag with um, the charts, the growing charts, and we gave them a uh, pencil and, and the tape measure. And so many of the, I didn't show this, but many of the farmers were actually um, tracking the pig growth per a month. And because they were doing that, that encouraged them to feed the pig more. Um, once they knew what the pig uh, w weighed when they sold it, they did actually were actually able to better bargain with the butcherman. And before we showed up, they many farmers said they didn't realize they could treat pigs for diseases. So not only did Florence and I do that, but we also taught the local uh, veterinary extension officers um, how to identify problems in pigs and how to treat them. And so I think they actually did have a, a good sense of the farmers had a good sense of what they were making from the pig, even though they didn't necessarily know when they were going to um, sell that pig. Um, was it worthwhile for them to even spend the $5 to grow the pig to 12 um, kilograms? Not for all, all farmers. Lots of farmers would have used the diets that Natalie um, uh, showed them instead. It would have been cheaper for them just to buy a little bit of dried rice and add some protein. And of course, we didn't do the studies on that, but I'm sure that would have helped. Um, and there were erratic crop seasons, um, so they would, the pigs would eat when the people ate and they wouldn't eat when the people didn't eat. So absolutely, the, 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 the steady growth that Natalie saw in her study wouldn't happen in real life on the farm because during February when nobody had any food, the pigs definitely wouldn't eat. They would probably still try to survive on grass and leaves. Um, uh, concerning the undercooked pork, so, so that was an interesting thing because the government people wanted us to tell the farmers and the butchermen never to eat that pork if it had signs of the cysts. But the problem is, is, is people were starving. And so if they killed a pig, of course they were going to eat it. And so um, what we encouraged them to do was boil it, boil the pork for 10 minutes and then fry it. And so that was way overcooked, um, but at least they were still getting the protein from the, the pork and there was not going to be um, any doubt that the cyst was killed. And there's a question from Fiona. Is there data on incidence and prevalence of epilepsy in the communities of the pork study? Yeah, so um, the very when I first went into the communities, um, I was um, uh, volunteering on two research projects. One project was um, was Florence's project. She was looking to see if she could find cysts in pigs and understand whether or not um, people were actually using latrines and whatnot. And the second project was looking at people who had epilepsy. So we identified families where there was a person with epilepsy. We went to those families and we um, asked questions about um, onset of epilepsy and um, and you know the the various different things. Was it a family that actually ever would consume pork? Those kinds of questions to try to figure out when the onset was and whether or not it could be linked to um, to teniosolium. And then, and then, uh, in a subset of those uh, people, there were uh, they did tests on those on those people. Um, this was funded by the University of Edinburgh, and what they found was um, um, they the. Uh, most of the epilepsy that wasn't um, uh, that that began after the person was five years old was likely due to um, the teniosolium tapeworm. Uh, prior to that, it was probably more likely due to either malaria or an infectious meningitis. And um, uh, and I'm I'm not remembering the exact prevalence to be or or incidents to be honest one of the questions that is often asked of me is um did the uh, prevalence of epilepsy in the communities go down and and i don't know the answer to that question so uh fiona i might have to go back over some of the research results and and let you know the prevalence in the communities 
it, that was interesting. We would go to we would go to schools and ask if there was anybody in the school who knew somebody with epilepsy, and then the school kids would leave the school and take us to those farms, and 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 it seemed every village had some. Um, it didn't seem every village did have some. I should have said it that way. Um, how much of a factor was water quality on the pig health, and is swill feeding a concern in the region? Um, so water quality. Um, Oh my goodness, um, that's an interesting question because people were uh, lucky to get water um, in two of the the um, two of the schools that we worked on. Um, they there was no safe water in the community. They were getting family water out of the ditches before we arrived and dug wells on the on those um, at at those particular schools. Um, the issue about water and pigs was more were they giving them water not not what was the quality but they would haul water um, for the family and they might give the the water after they washed food in it or after after they wash themselves or their clothes in the water they might give that water to the pig so the pig often get got i'm going to say secondhand water um, um swell feeding um very definitely, if there was any food left over at the end of a meal, the pigs got that. And so subsequently, there was some research done by other researchers looking at, um, at other zoonotic diseases in the pigs. And very definitely, salmonella was, um, was prevalent not, over, not only in live pigs, but also in pigs that they uh, saw at the slaughter plant. And we have a hand raised from Eustina, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have some tapeworm questions. So do we know how children are most commonly infected by the infective um, eggs? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. So if, if we can appreciate that um, many people were defecating outside, um, that, um, that because it's so difficult to get access to water, washing your hands after you defecate just wasn't something that was done in these communities. Um, if people were living on a half acre or two acre property and they had to find some place to defecate, they would defecate behind a bush, which may be very close to where the family's um, food was being grown. And, um, and, and studies not done by us, but by others um, and in other parts of the world show that the epilepsy is often uh, clusters in the family. And so they think likely what happens is somebody is perhaps the person who's preparing the food um, has the tapeworm and inadvertently um, uh, puts tapeworm eggs on the food before it's being served. So that's how we believe people get infected. And it's not just children who get infected that way. It's often an adult onset epilepsy um, caused by, by the tapeworm. So um, oftentimes there would be not a lot of people in a family that have the tapeworm, but, um, but one person in a, in, on a compound who had the tapeworm would be spreading it to the rest of the people in the, on that, that compound. Thank you. And can I add one more? Um, <laughs> Is it is medical treatment for an adult tapeworm in, infection generally accessible to people, yep. or is there um, barriers to that? Well, great question. So, depending on where they lived, they might have lived a five-minute walk to the nearest clinic. They might have lived a two-day walk to the nearest clinic. Uh, but but most of the people that we worked with um, would be able to get to a clinic in a day. And, um, and the positive thing is, is if they got to the clinic, the tapeworm medication would be free. Um, and um, and the, the, the problem with the epilepsy is if somebody has this problem in Canada, they would be put in the hospital, they would be put on high levels of steroids, and they'd be put on um, a drug to kill off the tapeworm uh, larva that's in the brain of the person, and they would probably be in the hospital for a couple of months through this process. And, um, and that kind of treatment wouldn't happen in Kenya. So once they got the epilepsy, um, there wouldn't be a treatment for them. They might go to the hospital and get some medication. They, they, I, I heard stories of people selling cows to try to get to the hospital to get the medication. They would get anti-seizure meds and as soon as another seizure happened, they'd say, see, the medication didn't work. And so they wouldn't, um, they would 
discontinue taking the medication. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'd just like to all thank you, Dr. Dewey, for being with us. And it was such a fascinating presentation, which I certainly enjoyed. And thank you everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you in two weeks.